I like to start thanking the dean and Professor Vasu for for these great seminar series. Well, just a very quick intro. I've been here for quite a long time in 1997, but from about the middle of 2000s, I started working on putting together this Center for Advanced Turbo Machinery and Energy Research. And, um, in, and primarily because in response to all the companies that are in our neighborhood that hire our students and um, like to engage with us in research activities. But getting to the main topic of today's discussion, kind of trying to connect with what I was mentioning in, in the September talk, the any attempts at decarbonization must be across all different industries and it has to be global and also has to be equitable for every part of the society and affordable, right? These are the four main uh, topics, our main criteria. And just to kind of explain that, the CO2 and greenhouse gases are produced by a large sector of pretty much everything that we do. For example, electricity and heat production is only 25%. But then we have got transportation, um, buildings, agriculture, industry. They also produce a large amount of uh, greenhouse gases. And hence, we must look at everything and not just focus one or two sectors. Second thing is that it is produced by all pretty much the entire world. Um, it doesn't matter where the CO2 is coming from, whether it is coming from electricity or from one part of the world, and hence it has to be global. And it turns out that the, the aviation business is global. So we really need to look at what we can do over the entire world to change, make changes. But also we need to point out that there is a large fraction of global population still with little or no access to electricity. And whereas we, equate quality of life with electricity and 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 that every every one of those activities lead to co2 and ghg release in other words we need to break this connection with technologies that are also affordable and it is where our talk for today starts so two main takeaway points is that the renewables for electricity generation and converting to ev is not same as decarbonization we have to talk about every single other sectors and for example, there are some very hard to decarbonize sectors. Notable among them are aviation and marine propulsion. And another ones are cement and steel industry. It turns out that we are working on both of those at UCF. And we'll be talking about the first one primarily today. With that gets to the project that Subit alluded to. So this is a new project that is supposed to be starting sometime later in the year. Um, it is just not UCF, we are the lead, but we are teaming up with Purdue University. Uh, they would be providing uh, different combustion related expertise and laboratory uh, facilities, as well as related to aerodynamics and some, including for supercritical carbon dioxide. And I'll be explaining some of that later. Then Georgia Tech, where they'll be doing systems engineering and try to make sure that the whole system can work together then obviously we need some uh, engine OEM and our engine OEM is GE. And one of the restrictions imposed by NASA was that the, whoever companies are part of the team must be located, located in US, including their headquarter. And that, that made the search pretty easy. And then we have got Boeing as our uh, airframe uh, partner and actually I cannot more than emphasize the kind of help that we received from Boeing while we are pre preparing this proposal. Then our techno-economics and technology transition colleagues from Southwest Research and our uh, software um, uh, partner who are also working closely with GE and Boeing and that brought in ANSYS and our uh, uh, airport colleague from Greater Orlando Aviation Authority. So this is kind of the overall team. I'll be talking about the rest of the uh, pictures in a minute. So let me move on to the next one. So if you look at the current, um, basically a, a um, typical jet engine, and this happens to be the LIP engine. Um, our reference airframe is 737-8 with LIP 1B. And in this case, you have got a a fan in the front, and then you have got a couple of uh, compressors, a combustor, then low, high pressure and the low pressure turbines. And 
and we are actually work could be working on different parts of the whole engine so now let us start from the beginning so question is at this point we are using kerosene based fuel to fuel these engines now whatever we do and i'll be coming in the subsequent slides why we chose the way we chose uh, but in this slide i'll be pointing out what we chose so in our case the fuel that would be stored in the airport would be liquid ammonia it would be at a slightly higher pressure um, but not tremendously higher pressure but then that is what would be used to fuel the airplanes now one thing to note at the at the flying altitude ammonia would be liquid by its nature so we do not have to do any special cooling to keep it liquid now that but that liquid ammonia gets fueled into the airplane and then we do bunch of different stuff with it first thing is that the liquid eventually has to be converted to gas and in our case we crack that into hydrogen and in the process it absorbs a lot of heat so the question is can we then utilize that uh, endothermic property to do good stuff for the engine yes in our case we are doing intercooling and cooling of cooling uh, of cooling air uh, that is used for turbine cooling to provide overall efficiency gain for the engine but then we crack it it is primarily ammonia that is i'm sorry hydrogen that is burnt and my colleague subit is going to be talking more about that later and then we do put a waste recovery system after the the at the end of the engine after the core and that is where we are employing a supercritical carbon dioxide cycle to convert uh, a good portion of that waste heat into um electricity for onboard use so that we do not have to tax or extract further power from the core shaft and then since we already have got ammonia on board as we do on power ground based power generation we are use that ammonia to convert the any nox that is produced and so that hardly any nox goes out to the tail end we do not know to the what extent but we also like to in, incorporate water condensation if we have to control contrail formation after the airplane so this is the overall plan for the supercritical co2 cycle that is a totally different cycle and i probably for the sake of time i'll skip that and move over to the next slide so again this is kind of what our aspirational goal and we'll see how much we can hold on to those but the point is if we look from the jta comparison obviously a big competitor is saf where saf could be produced by different biomasses or other or green kerosene whatever we may call under that category uh, but question is that how do we compare against them now we do not compare very well in the beginning but there are certain uh, features that makes us very attractive at the long end for example we can completely kill nox because we have got we are carrying ammonia and we can have a uh, selective catalytic reduction to do that we can potentially control control but the one of the main reason control would be all, or the or the or the water condensation would be lower anyway because we do not have any seeds for the water nucleation because we do not have any carbon based fuel that could potentially form soot um i'll probably skip this slide less rest of the slide uh, for the sake of time then coming to the uh the comparisons with the other alternatives well it is very difficult to replace kerosene because it has been optimized so well over the last so many decades but there are for example uh if we compare with hydrogen or methanol or ammonia those are some of the topics that some of the fuels that alternatives that people are talking about you can see either we need a very cold temperature to store it or very high pressure to store it one of the thing that we find from ammonia is that we do not need too low pressure a too low temperature to store it is automatically liquid liquid at the flying altitude but also there are certain advantages for example uh, interestingly ammonia has got more per unit volume hydrogen than hydrogen itself um in the liquid or 700 bar um gaseous form um and also we do have a large ammonia infrastructure so does the whole world because ammonia is used for agriculture um and if we ask ourselves why do we have got large scale hydrogen capability those are primarily related to the rather concentrated at the space facilities like in the kennedy space center or few other countries that use has got the rocket capability 
I'll probably skip this slide. I see that I'm getting close, um, well, uh, to my end of my talk. So again, another way to um, bring this comparison is that um, in the in the immediate term, because of this overwhelming advantage of kerosene, maybe for the next few decades, synthetic aviation fuel would have a lot better chance than any of these alternative fuels because we need a whole new infrastructure to be built. And with keeping that in mind, in our team, we have got techno-economic experts from Southwest Research, as well as actual aviation folks from the Orlando airport, and as well as safety uh, experts from within UCF who would be advising us what kind of infrastructural changes that are necessary. Because it is one thing for us to do that in the lab. It is another thing to implement all this in the plane and more importantly, in the airports around the world. So all those logistical upgrades that needs to be considered upfront if we are thinking of what kind of technology we'll be using. So keeping that in mind, kerosene or its synthetic alternative would have probably life for easily another 30, uh, 20 years or so, 30, 20, 30 years. But then the question is what would survive beyond that? In that context, we kind of put together this chart. Many of the source for sustainable aviation fuel happens to be based on biomasses. And there the question is the global supply chain quality control as well as competition against food, which may not be insignificant considering that the, the population of the world uh, has to be taken into account as well. So in that context, we feel that maybe ammonia as a hydrogen carrier has got good chance that requires um, a good look. And that is exactly what we'll be doing. Well, we are in a university. We, our first and foremost job is to train students uh, and create the tomorrow's workforce. So we also have got a number of education enhancement plan with training the students for the fundamentals, making exposure for them to the industry, helping them to retain the knowledge better through the weekend bootcamp kind of situations, and also help our graduate students to be better in presenting their research in a very non-technical way to, to the society. <clears throat> and we created different plans for that. In terms of technology transition, we actually are thinking beyond that maybe the next stage would be uh, somebody like Southwest Research taking the lead of mid-tierl demonstration projects and eventually somebody like MCO, Goa, like local airport, teaming up with the OEMs for the full-scale ground testing. And with that, I will end my talk with the acknowledgements. Obviously, being a university professor, I cannot do anything without students. So they receive the first level of the most important uh, acknowledgement. I also need to acknowledge my colleague Subit. He had been egging me for a long time so that I do not drop writing this proposal, and I eventually did. Um, of course, I had to use my office for my bed for about five weeks or so, and luckily UCF did not complain about that. But most importantly, the SUS of Florida Turbine Initiative that started in 2006, and EPCAP, Florida Center for Advanced Propulsion, they created the groundwork that eventually lead to all the technologies that we proposed in this proposal. With that, I'll end my talk.